Good morning, church. Well, we're into week three of our uh, Let's Social Distance time here in Ohio, and the first full week is now passed of our Let's Stay at Home order from Governor DeWine's office. So I'm wondering how you're doing today. I imagine that some of you have some anxiety still about kind of personal issues. Will you be safe? Will your family be safe? Will your friends be safe? That's a natural concern. I think it affects all of us. Others are wondering, perhaps looking through a little wider lens, will your business survive this? What will happen to your employees and your customers? Will your company still be there when all this is over and will you have a job to go back to? Will the uh, economy just collapse or it, it, it will go into a depression or we, can we climb out of just a bad recession? And will the stock market regain quickly enough to allow my retirement to be something that's comfortable and not austere? We have a lot of, really, uh, of concerns today, but we also have two lessons from our scriptures that speak actually to both of those types of concerns. One to the broad national concerns, and the other is focused intimately on one person and on one family. In the story of the raising of Lazarus, we encounter the only identifiable family in all of the Gospels who are called the friends of Jesus. Now, I'm absolutely sure he had more friends than just this one family. But these are the ones that get lifted up. Something happened with these three siblings, the sisters Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Some bond was formed so that Jesus had an intimate and abiding friendship with them. That's why when Jesus left Jerusalem, where he had really got under the skin of some very powerful people, and he was in danger of losing his freedom and perhaps even his life, and as he leaves the city and goes out of Judea back towards the Galilee, word reaches him that his friend Lazarus is gravely ill. And so eventually Jesus returns to Bethany, which is just outside of Jerusalem, and he walks back into harm's way. And you'll notice I said eventually, because Jesus does something quite strange. He delays setting out. We get the feeling that his disciples were ready to pack their bags and leave on a moment's notice, but Jesus stays two days longer and doesn't hurry off. Dr. Melinda Kovic said in commenting on this passage that Jesus did not hurry to the bedside of his dying friend because he sees into the circumstances of death to the very end of the story. Now, there are several aspects of this story that I want to lift up for you. And as I do so, I ask you to think about our time also. Now, the first is the private conversation that Jesus has with Martha. As he is approaching the city, she hears that he's coming and she quietly leaves her home where the mourning is taking place. She comes out and sits with Jesus. Now, this is another example of what I told you about a few weeks ago. Jesus will have a conversation with someone in John's Gospel. They will seemingly talk about the same subject, but they don't understand it in the same way. And it's in the tension of that misunderstanding that we are invited to look and listen carefully to what Jesus is saying to discover what the truth is for us. Martha begins here. Jesus, if you had only been here then my brother would not have died. And Jesus responds, your brother will rise again. I know, Martha says, he will rise again on the last day in the resurrection of the just. Now, those last words, the just, it's my addition, but it is what Martha meant. She understood resurrection as it was understood by the Jews of her day that when the Messiah finally came back and established his reign, then the good people who had died without ever seeing the Messiah would be raised back to life. Good people, just people, righteous people, they and they alone 
would be resurrected to live under the time reign of the Messiah. But to this misunderstanding of what Jesus is saying, Jesus voices his seventh and final I am saying. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, though he is dead, will rise again. And the one who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he adds to that a question for Martha and a question for you and for me and for each one of us. Do you believe this? This is the seventh I am statement of Jesus. And the significance of that is I am is the sacred name of God given back in Exodus 3 to Moses at the story of the burning bush. Go back and read that and, and see the importance of that. When Jesus says, I am, he is making a bold claim. And he uses seven images to describe it. Now I want to just talk to you about the last three of those. In chapter 9, which we heard last week, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But what does this mean? To be the light of the world, Jesus encounters a blind man and he heals him of his lack of vision. He takes away from him the dark world he had occupied for all of his life and he gives him light to see. In John 10, which has not been in our reading cycle, Jesus will say, I am the good shepherd. What does he mean by that? He means that in his presence, everyone who trusts in him and believes in him will be gathered together. Those from this flock and those from other herds that we've never yet discovered. They'll be brought together in the same place so that he will keep them safe. So that he can protect them. So that he can love them. In John 11, he declares... I am the resurrection and the life. No one in this story really believes that. At least they don't believe it on the level that Jesus proclaims it. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. I want you to think about that. But there is a second aspect of this story that we also have to notice. Martha goes back to her sister Mary and tells her that Jesus is asking for her. And Mary doesn't sneak out of the house as Martha did. She up and runs out of the house. And all of those folks who have come to support her in her mourning, they run after her. So that when she reached Jesus, it's a very public event. And it's an event that is filled with pathos. It's an event that, that is probably best understood in the shortest verse in the Bible that occurs here. Jesus wept. He joins his tears to those of Mary and Martha. He is visibly moved and the gathered crowd sees and understands how deep his feelings are. Even though he knows what is about to happen in a short while, he weeps, and in doing so, he fully justifies the sorrow that we feel whenever we lose one we love. Grief, and the pain of grief is real, and tears are a natural response. Jesus felt it. He displayed it. And he wept. Now back to the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus had been dead and in the tomb for four days. What does that mean? Well, not to put too fine a point on it, he was decomposing. Jesus says, open the tomb. And Martha replies to him, Probably what everyone else was thinking, Lord, you know he's been in there four days. There's going to be a stench. She says this 
to the same Lord who had just told her that her brother would rise because he is the resurrection and the life. Open the tomb, Martha. And they opened it. And Jesus shouts, Lazarus, come out. You see, before that moment, Martha didn't understand what it meant to be with the resurrection and the life in that moment. The crowds were still criticizing him for not being there to heal Lazarus and were saying that it wasn't of, was not of great consequence that he should show up just to cry with the family. Do you remember what Jesus told his disciples way back in the beginning of this, this lesson when all of this was starting up? He told them that this illness does not lead to death but rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. This is the role of death in the presence of the resurrection and the life. Death is vanquished. It is vanquished because God wills it, not because anyone in this story has the faith to make it so, for everyone in the story doesn't really believe that it will be so. Some hope it will be so, but always at a future time. Lazarus was raised because Jesus and the Father are one. And in the presence of God, death doesn't stand a chance. To quote Dr. Kuivik one more time, human belief is not the source of the raising of Lazarus. Jesus' oneness with the Father is the source of this rising. Now, even as Jesus knew the grief of that moment, of that loss, so we know the very real worry about the safety of those we love. But let this story of the resurrection of Lazarus be for you a source of hope. Because this disease that is flying around our world right now is not the last word. Not for you, not for those we love, not for your family, not for your friends. But what about the bigger picture? What about the nation and our economy? I invite you to consider the vision that Ezekiel had in today's first lesson. Judah, the very last nation left of the covenant community, had been defeated and destroyed. And the empirical armies of Babylon were breaching, had breached the walls of Jerusalem. They had slain what was left of Judah's army, and their corpses were added to the many inside Jerusalem who had already died from starvation or illness. The remaining survivors were led away as slaves, likely being marched past the corpses of family and friends they had to leave behind. They had experienced the death of their nation. They looked at a future only of servitude and struggle. But Ezekiel had another vision. He speaks of being taken to a place, a high place, and told to look down into a valley. And, and the Hebrew says that as he looked around and around and around, all he saw in this valley were scattered bones, a valley filled with the bones of the nation. The language of the passage says he looked around and he saw on these bones that they were sun bleached by the sun. Sun bleached. They were lacking even in marrow. They were brittle bones. They were bones without the possibility of life in them. And in his vision, he is given a command. Listen carefully to what it is. Prophesy to the bones. Prophesy. Speak. Use words to address what does not exist. And he does so. And in the valley there is a rattling of the bones. And they come together, bone to bone. They find the right place to reconnect. And out of this scattered valley of bones become a field of skeletons. But the power of his words are not finished yet. Because suddenly the skeletons begin to be covered sinew and muscle form and then flesh comes upon it and where there were only skeletons before 
Now there are bodies, but still dead bodies, bodies in whom there is no life. You know, Deb and I were in France a couple of years ago. We, we stayed at a hotel, we walked around the city, we went to the museums, and the D'Orsay Museum on the banks of the Seine, I mean, it kind of starts off with art where the collection, the Louvre, leads off and, and goes forward. And I want to tell you, I, I've seen before a statuary. And you know what I mean, the statuary that's been uh, found in ancient Greece or ancient Rome. And, and they're obviously marvelously, skillfully carved, but as you look at them, they are pitted, and you know, that arm is broken off, and, and there's all that kind of damage. And I've never been really captivated by them. But in the D'Orsay Museum, I saw a statuary that had been made about 300 years ago, and probably kept inside for that time. And I was fascinated by the lifelikeness of it. I remember especially there was a statue of a boy and his dog, and I could almost see the boy pick up a, a stick and throw it and the dog run after it. It had everything that spoke of life, except breath. Again, God says to the nation, prophesy and tell the breath to come into these bodies. Now the word breath in Hebrew is ruach, and that is the same word that is used for the Spirit of God. And you know what's going to happen. He prophesies, and by that word, breath comes into the bodies, and those dead bodies live. What had been a valley of bones now becomes a vision of a nation recreated. All of it through the power of a word. The raising of Lazarus, the coming together of the sun-bleached bones, the creation of the universe itself, and all life that is in it comes from the Word. That is, the Word with a capital W. I'm not speaking of spiritual words, of magical or mystical incantations or phrases. For the deliverance from our own trials, from the death we fear, and even that which we will one day experience, our help comes from the Word. This is the word John spoke of in the opening verses of his Gospel. The Word was in the beginning. The Word who was God. The Word who was with God. The Word who is one with the Father. This one sees also the end of your story. The end of our story. An end that we can identify by a name. Life. Trust in the Word who sees beyond our present crisis to God's future. Because it's there that you belong. And it is there that you will be loved by the Word, who is the resurrection and the life. Amen.